thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I did say this before, but if you are more than 20 miles or more than one person, just kindly put that in the chat for us tonight. Um, we also are just curious for anyone who received our email directly promoting tonight's history at home, if there was an issue with the email essentially looking squished in form and it was hard to find the link. If you experienced that, just please let me know. We're just trying to figure out what the source of that was as it went through. Um, so tonight, um, we're thrilled to welcome again a Historical Society of Bloomfield trustee, Rich Rockwell. Um, he's presenting a new program this evening on the photography of Charles Warren Eaton from 1900 to 1925. Um, Rich, I'm sure we'll tell you more about this, but discovered a set of over a thousand negatives of Charles Warren Eaton's photos um, of various sites in Europe, including a lot of scenes of canals, windmills, architecture, etc. Um, for many who may not know, Eaton lived um, right here in Bloomfield um, up until 1937 and was also a protege of George Innes. Um, so we're going to hear more about Rich's experience going through these photographs and how they also became digitized and curated um, up on a website, which I am going to post two links up in the chat um, to the Historical Society of Bloomfield site, as well as to charleswarreneaton.org. So if you want to look at those images closer, you can do so. Um, so Rich Rockwell has lived um, in Montclair and Bloomfield for almost 30 years, authored Bloomfield Through Time, if you've seen this publication before, and has really become a leading expert on the Morris Canal and in Bloomfield. So he is a councilman at large in Bloomfield and serves on the Bloomfield Morris Canal Greenway Committee and numerous other civic organizations. So again, we're thrilled to have Rich with us here tonight. Um, just a little note that all of our programs are always brought to you free of charge. We do record them and place them up on YouTube. So if you are so kind to make a donation to the Montclair History Center, that is always appreciated. And now I'm going to hand it off to Rich Rockwell for tonight. Okay, thank you for that introduction, Angelica. Um, and thanks for mentioning the connection to Montclair, um, the Georgianist connection. That's one of the little things about Eaton. So yeah, I'm going to start by telling you about how I got interested and in, involved in this. Um, and Priscilla Doug Douglas Polkinghorne, we call this the collection of negatives, the Priscilla Douglas Polkinghorne collection, because she's the one who gave these negatives to us. And I'll explain a little bit about how that happened. So I found out several years ago with the, as being involved in the Historical Society of Bloomfield, Somebody was told us that they were going to donate uh, a set of magic lantern slides to us. And they're very relatively fragile and you don't want to handle them or expose them to light a lot. So I wondered if there was a way to scan them and digitize them. So I mentioned that to a colleague on the, at the historical site and he said, well, I've got this collection of lantern slides of Crystal Palace and London and um, you, you're free to experiment with them if you want. So I got his collection and I found that I could do this. Uh, you need a special scanner, which, which I have, so I can scan negatives and lantern slides. And these are from his collection of the Crystal Palace, the couple, the couple photographs at the top of the Crystal Palace. And then there was a number of other scenes in London. Um, the one in the lower right is the Nightingale family tomb. It's in Westminster Abbey. And then we did receive the lantern slides that we were promised from a, a man named David Frainer. His grandfather was Reverend Wilson Frainer, and he was a photographer. He was an amateur photographer. He was also a minister in Bloomfield, and he took a lot of photographs of Bloomfield, and we have those on our website, the Historical Society of Bloomfield, hsob.org. We have a photo gallery link on that page that will take you to uh, these photographs of Bloomfield. But he also took a lot of photographs of travels abroad. And we recently, I recently added some of those to, to the collection. The one on the lower left, mm -hmm. Palestine, he took some really nice photographs of Palestine mm -hmm. that were in, in uh, probably in around 19, 1908, 1910. And uh, the, uh, photograph on the right was a trip to Cuba. And he used to take these lantern slides and show them to uh, to entertain people in church, like a, they would do Friday evening programs or Sunday school classes 
where um, he'd show these slides. And then there are a couple of people who are who are not on mute and hearing some background noises. Can everybody please put the schools on mute if you're not already? And then um, I, we had a lot of uh, really uh, photocopies of bad photographs in our collection in the Historical Society of houses. And I discovered that somebody told me, well, we've got they're the negatives of those photographs are in Glen Ridge. So I explored that and discovered that Glen Ridge had this collection of now these are really high quality negatives, higher quality than what Eaton uh, had. Um, they were taken by Nathan Russell, who was a realtor uh, around 19, early 1900s, between 1895 or so up till about 1915. And the houses that he had for sale, he photographed. So we have a collection of several hundred photographs of houses in Bloomfield, Glen Ridge, and Montclair that are also on our website that I uh, digitized and put on a website. These are some of the scenes in Bloomfield, and all these, a lot of these photographs led to when I used to see when I see books of historical photographs, I want to see. I'm, I'm always wondering, well, where is this and what's there now? So I like to do then and now photographs, and I did that in a in a book called Bloomfield Through Time, which is mostly a lot of Eaton's photographs, a lot of the Nathan Russell photographs of houses and showing uh, both the historic photograph and the photograph of what's there now. And then I, I discovered that um, we, before I knew that we had a whole collection of Eaton negatives, I discovered that we had this collection of photographs of the Morris Canal that were taken by Charles Warren Eaton, that somebody in, 19, in the 1970s carefully had each one of them printed and he described the location of each one of these photographs. This, this is a man named Bob Goller who literally wrote, wrote the book about the Morris Canal. So he's very familiar with locations and was able to identify a lot of these photographs. And this is one of Eaton's photographs of the Morris Canal. Um, he carefully composed his photographs. So you'll see some really uh, really, I think a lot of his photographs are really quite beautiful, the way he uh, composed them with uh, reflections in canals and, and uh, waterways. And um, this, is, this is a scene of the Morris Canal in Bloomfield. This, the structure that you see there, this over on the left, the wooden structure and this, this is an aqueduct that was built to carry the canal over the river. This is going over Third River. So today, this is JFK Drive, and Foley Field would be just off to the left. This is one of his photographs of the Morris Canal. Um, this is another, the, looking in the opposite direction, this is the aqueduct here in the foreground. And the bridges in the background are the James Street Bridge. So today this is JFK Drive and um, JFK Drive goes under the James Street Bridge in the same location. And this is the Belleville Avenue Bridge over the Morris Canal. Today this is the intersection of Belleville Avenue and JFK Drive. So this is uh, sort of the quintessential photograph of Eaton. If you saw a book, this is used in books and any place where they wanna show Eaton. So he was known as a pine tree painter. So he's shown in this photograph in front of one of his pine tree paintings. And this is what he looked like as a younger man. We have uh, uh, some of these photographs of him, these headshots in the collection that we have, that we inherited from uh, Priscilla Polkinghorn. So just a little background on Eaton. He was born in 1857 in Albany. He moved to New York in 1879 and worked in a, as a clerk in a department store. He didn't have any background in art or, or painting, but um, he had a friend who, when he was in New York, took some painting classes and he wanted to learn, was starting to paint, and he showed Eaton one of his paintings. God damn this thing. Eaton, uh, we can hear that, whoever said was complaining about the thing. If you could mute yourself, that would be helpful. Thanks. Um, so 
he uh the friend of his showed him this painting and he said to himself i i could do better than that so he started painting and he started taking classes and by 1882 he sold his first painting um 1887 he was still in the learning phase and just getting started at painting um that's the first time he took a trip to europe um he moved to bloomfield in 1887 in 1888 he was um, advertising sketching classes which he was doing to to get a source of, for, as a source of income and then he got interested in photography and was involved in the montclair camera club in 1898 and by 1900 uh, he got his first award he got an honorable mention at the paris exposition and then he did well enough at, with his artwork by selling the artwork to build a house in Bloomfield and to travel to Europe every year. He went to Europe every year and, and photographed and, and did painting. And that's where you're going to see a lot of the photographs that um, I'm going to show you. So in 1914, he built a house in Bloomfield on Monroe Place. He died in 1937. Now, the connection to George Innes, um, Eaton did when he was working in new york and living in new york he had a studio and in the same building george ennis also had a studio and eaton and some one of his uh colleagues who shared a studio were preparing some paintings to be sent to a, an exhibit they were working on and they were outside the studio in a hallway and George Innes happened to walk past and saw one of Eaton's paintings and said, I, I want to meet the, the artist who did this. And he met Eaton and bought the painting and they developed a friendship. And he, uh, George Innes was a mentor to Eaton. Um, Innes was older than him. Um, George Innes' son was about the same age as Eaton and they became friends also. And one of the reasons that Eaton decided to live in Bloomfield, he was really interested in these bucolic scenes and he was looking for living in a, a more um, relaxed bucolic atmosphere. And he moved to Bloomfield and because he would, one of the reasons being because he would be near George Innes, he used to walk from Bloomfield to Innes' studio which was near where uh, Mountainside Hospital is today. And he got a number of awards uh, between 1900 and 1910 was when he was really uh, very productive with the artwork and, and getting recognized for it. So these are some of the awards he had. And we also recently acquired, somebody donated to us um, a collection of things that eventually were also part of uh, Priscilla Polkinghorne's, uh, his estate that she inherited. But we now have catalogs, the original catalogs for most of these exhibits that Eaton um, exhibited in. So he's buried in Bloomfield Cemetery. Um, he died in 1937. Uh, he's buried along with his sister, Charlotte, she was a bit older than him and she actually his mother died when he was very young and she helped raise him when he was a child and his her daughter grace was his niece who also lived with them and speaking of priscilla polkinghorne this is her um she was um she she was like a niece to eaton she called him uncle charlie uh they lived next door for a while and her father was close friends uh, one of Eaton's best friends. Um, and um, Priscilla was interested in art too. And she pretty much grew up around her uncle Charlie and admired him and spent a lot of time with him. So he left his estate to her when he died. And the paintings that you see around her are his paintings, part of the estate that she inherited. When um, when the Great Depression hit, um, this kind of artwork was not selling at all. And uh, by the time Eaton died, he um, even though he had gotten that recognition earlier on, people weren't buying these kind of paintings near the end of his life. And 
he ended up dying in, in, in with a lot of debts. And um, Priscilla inherited about 500 of his paintings along with some other artifacts and things. So this was her in the 1980s, I forget the exact date, but she lived in a community in California and she put on a little presentation about her uncle Charlie to an organization, an art organization in the community where she lived. And we have a videotape of that. And uh, she sh shows a lot of his paintings and talks about him, tells a story of his life and some of the work that he did. So this is an example of one of his, his paintings. He, he, one of the pine tree paintings, it's called Afterglow. Um, they, they, he was considered a tonalist and the type of painting were, were usually considered um, intimate landscapes. And he often used sunset, uh, the lighting of sunset in dramatic ways, uh, as you see in this painting. And he does have at least one painting in the Montclair Art Museum, uh, which is this one called Strip of Pines, which he did in 1908. And he also did a lot of paintings of the Morris Canal. So this is one of the Morris Canal photographs that we have in the Bloomfield Public Library. Uh, they have four of his paintings in the Bloomfield Public Library. They have one in Bloomfield Cemetery, and we have several of them in the museum, uh, Bloomfield Historical Society Museum. This, uh, this painting was the top of the inclined plane, which would today be JFK Drive at the intersection of Hoover Avenue. There was a bridge, Hoover Avenue uh, had a bridge over the canal. And uh, this, this was uh, a painting of uh, Watsessing Park, what used to be Watsessing Park, winter sunset in the woods. We have a lot of photographs that he took of uh, Third River that are a similar style of uh, photograph to this painting. And one of the things that intrigued me about these photographs was I learned that Eaton often used the photographs that he took as models back in his studio. So when he would go to a site in Europe, he would photograph it and do a small color sample. Like on, he actually uh, did some of these paintings on cigar box lids. So they were the size of a cigar box lid. He would do the color sample and then he would bring the painting back and use the painting as a model in the studio. So I knew a lot of his paintings and I wanted to see if we had the photographs that he used for those paintings. And that was one of the things that drove me to, to scan all these photographs and collect them so I could see if I could find the photographs of paintings. And this is one of them. And I also have some other examples that I'm gonna show later. There's some samples on the website. This is one of the, so he took a lot of photographs in Bruges, a lot of the canals in Bruges. This was one of the town uh, of Bruges gates, uh, original gates of the town. And um, one of the things that I, this, this is a town in, in Belgium called Dinan. And uh, some of a lot of the buildings in this town were, were, were bombed in World War I. Um, but in, in doing research, I didn't know where, some of, some of the photographs were not labeled. I didn't even know where they were. And I would do Google searches for things like cathedrals. And I found this cathedral that matched the cathedral in the photograph. By the way, the photograph on the left was colorized using modern um, web colorization, one of the sites that does color colorizing of black and white photographs. Um, and I found the, the city where this was. There's a cathedral there. There's a citadel on the top of the, the mountain. And I believe that a lot of the missing buildings that aren't there now um, were bombed in World War I. But one of the things that I found very striking was I would find a lot of these uh, equivalent locations in, in places like this, and they still look almost exactly the same as they did 100 years ago when Eaton photographed them, except a lot of them have cars and that some of the areas that you would have seen in the old photographs are now uh, parking lots and parking spaces. This is another example. Uh, there's a, it's a beguinage, a convent in uh, Bruges. Um, and the photo on the right is what it looks like today. So this is his house in Bloomfield. It was 63 Monroe Place. 
And it's still there today. This is what it looks like today. It still looks pretty similar to the way it did when he built it and lived there. This is his sister, Charlotte. In the room that was originally intended to be Eaton's studio, um, and as you can see, there are some of his paintings hanging on the wall, but you can see a lot of artifacts that look like the kinds of things somebody who went to Europe regularly would collect. He collected brass candlesticks and pewter objects and sculptures, and you can see some of those things on the fireplace and the, and the lamp, lamp hanging on the from the ceiling and and rugs that he probably would have brought back from trips to Europe. And he, so this was originally his studio. The he planned it so there was a large window uh, that would be to the right of this that's a north facing uh, window for the, for the lighting. This is that room from the outside with a large window that was facing north. But the story is his um, working, in, working in this studio, um, his sister and his niece were constantly um, coming in and talking to him and distracting him and he was finding it difficult to get any work done so he built the studio separate from the house in the in the back the build the studio is still there too and it also has a north facing window on the back side which you can't see from here but um, that was the studio that he used um, this is his niece grace coming down the stairs in their house with a, a lot of his paintings hanging on the walls. And he also built a, an arbor in the backyard with a grapevine, uh, which the arbor was inspired by some of the some of the arbors that he saw in Italy. And some of them photographed some of them too. another view of the arbor in the backyard. So he also took a lot of pictures of Bloomfield. Um, rather than uh, documenting buildings and bridges and artifacts and things that you typically think of seeing, he, he, he was more interested in these kind of, he was more interested in, in, in creating a scene, like this is Oaks Mill and Oaks Pond, but you know, it was composed to show the the trees more to, more than focusing on the mill this is davies mill which used to be a paper mill that um he photographed the the mill was um near if you're if you're driving north on the parkway at the essex toll booth over off to the right there's a large open space there near the animal shelter that's where this mill and the pond were so the the negatives were not um, were not stored under optimal conditions. Some of them had been water damaged. We lost a number of them because they were so damaged, and some of them had just had some regular photography problems, backlighting problems, and uh, reflections like this. And I spent a fair amount of time on a lot of them repairing them digitally using uh, using Photoshop. So in this example. Um, the, the originals on the left, the repaired versions on the right. It's very difficult to, to fix uh, this kind of reflection in, in, a gla in glasses like this. So I learned a lot of little tricks and techniques for doing these kind of repairs. I got better and better at it as I went along. As a matter of fact, I went back recently and redid all of the photographs of the Morris Canal because I had learned so much about techniques for repairing them and improving them, but I redid them and they're on the, the new versions are on the website now. But in this one, what I did was I copied her left eye and uh, flipped it over and pasted it on top of her right eye to avoid the uh, glare. Uh, some of the negatives, this uh, negative had a, was partly broken, like they, they were, they're, um, uh, acetate negatives. These were not glass. They were small three by four acetate negatives. So some of them were damaged. Uh, some of them were, uh, so this one had a backlighting problem that um, I, I fixed to get a, a lot more detail out of, out of the photograph. 
And this one was actually split in, in two pieces. You can see on the left version, there's a, the streak going down there is actually a, a break in the plastic, the negative. And I repaired it digitally using Photoshop on the right. Another one that had um, a, a, some damage on the top and um, a number of different problems that, um, that I repaired. And one of the things that I love to do, what these, the, because they're negatives, you can get some really detailed, uh, when you, you can zoom in and get a lot of uh, good detail. In this photograph, I was looking around and I wanted to see, I, I, I spent some time trying to read some of the street signs and find out where uh, some of the signs that were on stores to identify some of the locations. And this particular one, I was interested in what those objects were in the window over on the right. And I noticed the guy that I'm circling with, there's a guy standing at the corner of the building. I'm like, what is going on here? So I zoomed in. It turns out he's at a public urinal. Um, in the early 1900s, these were fairly popular in cities like Bruges, Paris, London, um, Amsterdam, often located near canals or bodies of water. And uh, I wonder what this guy would have thought if he knew 100 years from now, people would be watching him standing at a urinal. So the collection of these photographs is on a website. It's charleswarneaton.org, easy to remember. So you're free to go back here anytime and look at all these photographs. When um, I like this quote from uh, Eaton had a, an, an exhibit at the Montclair Art Museum in 1980. And Maureen O'Brien um, prepared the, was one of the authors of his catalog. And she said he didn't simply experiment with a camera, but became a competent and avid photographer. His photographs show a bold and frequently exceptional use of the camera to raise the horizon, select elegant curves in landscape, or capture a racing angled double perspective of poplars along a canal. And that statement refers to the photograph on the left as one of the examples of this, what she was talking about. So this is the website. I'm going to switch over and go to the website now. So hold on here a minute. I have to change my screen share. Okay, is everybody seeing, are you seeing the website now? Yes. Okay. So this is it. Um, this is a, about a thousand photographs that were taken by Charles Warren Eaton. So because there's a thousand photographs, I organized them by the country and the city that they were in. So the ones in Bloomfield are over here under US. We've got a whole series of photographs of Bloomfield. There's the ones about Eaton, the Morris Canal, his house and garden, Third River, and some that we weren't able to identify. He also took a couple photographs in Paramus of all places and Colebrook, Connecticut. He spent some time in Colebrook, Connecticut where he took a lot of photographs. So what I did was, in addition to organizing those by the country and city, I chose the best of one. So if you just want a quick overview of what the things were that Eaton did, you can go to these best of categories. And I'm going to show you my favorite photographs um, that are on the site. Um, I actually started, this started out being the, the 10 best photographs, but I got a little carried away and we've got about, I think I have 44. So this is a photograph in Bern, Switzerland. And um, this, there's an interesting story behind this. I looked uh, a couple months ago, the Glen Ridge Historical Society sent out a photograph sent out their newsletter and right on the cover of it was a photograph and it was of this clock tower and gate and it still it looks like this it was taken by the president of the their historical society who had just been there recently and took a photograph of it and it looks exactly like this and actually i wasn't even sure this was barren i thought it was um a different a different set it was basil but um, i was able to correctly identify it from the photograph that he took um, this was also a lot of these cities 
had uh, belfries, bell towers, clock towers um, that were sometimes, this was a gate to the city. Sometimes they were city uh, town halls. So Mechelen, um, this is a, a, a just amazing at the number of cathedrals, a num number of cities in, in Europe that have these huge cathedrals. Um, this is one of them. Some of these towns I had never heard of before. And, and as I said, a lot of them I found by, by looking at Google images of cathedrals. Uh, some of them were labeled. Um, a lot of the negatives were labeled in general categories like um, Bruges or um, the, uh, the country that they were taken in. So he took a lot of photographs of the canal in Bruges. Here's the convent that I showed earlier. And, and again, another example of, of how he used reflections in, in the canal in the, uh, to compose the photograph. And he would also include a lot of these in his paintings too. One of the other uh, interesting things about a lot of these cities, you, you see this large building. This, this is the belfry of Bruges, the building, the large building on the left. This was, this was their town hall. Um, a, and a lot of cities in Europe have belfries and, and town hall buildings that are just as large and elaborate as, as, the, as the large cathedrals that might also be located in the town. So there's a cathedral off to the right, and then the belfry, which is part of the town hall on the on the left, and a lot of uh, windmills. So there's a several towns that he spent a lot of time in. There was a canal, the canal in Bruges going north, went to a town called Dama that was also in Belgium, and then continued on further into the Netherlands into a town called Slaus. So he took a lot of photographs along that canal uh, of windmills and uh, cathedrals and poplar trees and dramatic views of uh, scenes on the canal. The, these are poplar trees. The, the large trees with sort of slight bends in them are poplar trees. Another uh, this another this is Slaus in the Netherlands. Uh, another windmill, and in the distance you can see another cathedral. And you know you see these simple little villages like this that have a have a huge cathedral right there. This is in France. Another cathedral. Another the photograph. I think this is the same one I showed before. But he took a lot of different photographs of of these poplar trees on the canal and did a number of paintings of this similar scenes also. This is in Chart, France. Another one, France. It's interesting how many cities in Europe had canals too and still do. We don't really think about that much, but a lot of these cities, that was an important form of transportation. So Eaton also spent a lot of time in Italy at uh, Lake Como. He did a, a, a lot of paintings around that area too. So this is one of the um, uh, church in um, Bellagio on Lake Como. Another town in Italy with canals, Chogia. And he took a lot of photographs in Venice. So this is a cathedral in Venice, a basilica. Uh, and a lot of these scenes in Venice still look this, this way today also. This, um, I've seen contemporary photographs of this location that look pretty similar. And the Rialto Bridge still looks much like it did back then. Uh, another cathedral um, in Courtrai. This is Delft in the Nether Netherlands, another cathedral on, and, a, and another canal. 
And this is Dinant, which I showed before um, with the cathedral and the citadel up on the mountain. Really beautiful, interesting city. He took also took a lot of photographs of women doing laundry in the river. <laughs> this is one of my favorites. Uh, this is Furness in Belgium. Again, we've got a, a cathedral a cathedral on the right and a probably town hall and belfry on the left. Um, this uh, this uh, found a, I found a contemporary photograph of this location also, which looks similar, except this is an example where instead of seeing this open marketplace, there will be cars parked there in front of the shops. And this is Frankfurt. Heidelberg, women doing laundry in the river in Heidelberg. This is Nuremberg. And this, uh, I also found contemporary photographs of this cathedral. This cathedral was badly damaged in World War I, but it was rebuilt. So it's really incredible. They, they, a lot of this, a lot of the locations that were bombed in World War I were rebuilt to, to look as close as possible to the original buildings. And after World War I, he never went back. He went back to Europe once. He was so depressed at seeing the damage, uh, in, especially in Bruges, that, uh, he, that he never went back. And I wish he had taken photographs of some of the scenes that he would have seen there. Um, it would have been interesting to compare them to what's there today because if, if he had gone, if he had waited like 10 or 20 years later and gone back, he probably would have seen a lot of those buildings that had been rebuilt. Another scene in Nuremberg, another, this is another um, city gate and clock tower. Another uh, city gate in Harlem. And a cathedral in Harlem. And he, he did take some photographs of people but he rarely included them in his paintings. He said at one point, it's just too hard to paint them. And he focused on landscapes instead of people. Another town in Belgium, another little small village with a, with a large cathedral. And Middleburg, uh, another, um, that is a that's that's a town hall on the left. And another uh, so this is back in Italy um, on, on the um, a lot of uh, a lot of the photographs are on Lake Como, but uh, other some other lakes in the area be, around the, the border between Switzerland and Italy. Lake this is Lake Lucerne. And this is Winsford, England. So I, I tried, made a somewhat of an effort to try to communicate with people in these locations. I thought, gee, like a historical society in Bruges or some of these places might be interested in seeing these photographs. I didn't have much luck in con contacting and connecting with anybody, but I did connect with somebody in the village of Winsford Historical Society. He said, oh yeah, I know each one of those locations in the photograph, they still look like that today. He offered to send me photographs, I haven't gotten them yet. But um, this is a village that, some of these places are, um, are historic sites that, that are um, still preserved and uh, maintained uh, as they looked. Some of them are several hundred years old. Some of these cathedrals and the town halls, uh, another scene in Winsford. Okay, now there's also best of the um, Bruges, Dama, and Slouts, and there's best of Germany and Venice. But I'm going to show you, I, I wanted to experiment. I showed you one of those photographs earlier that was, um, oh, let me show you something else. If you, if you do explore this website, 
when you go to one of these particular sections, this button up here is for a slideshow. So you can just click that and it'll go through the whole photograph in that section and a slideshow. But on the home page, way at the, if you scroll all the way to the bottom, there is a thing called a tag cloud. So these are categories of things in the photographs. So you could always come here. It's like an index to all the things that are that are in this collection. So if you wanted to see photographs of cathedrals, for example, we, it shows you how many there are. We have 26 photographs of cathedrals. You can click on that and you'll see all of the cathedrals in, in the whole collection uh, in whatever city they're in. But I want to show you some of the colorized photographs. So I used one of these websites that, um, that colorizes photographs. And I chose the ones that I thought were, I can't get, wait a minute. Uh, I chose the ones that I thought were even better as colorized than they were as black and white. So these are some of the photographs that were, I thought the colorization happened to do, come out very well and actually make improvements. Uh, they brought out some of the detail and it made it much more richer and almost three-dimensional and just brought it a little more to life. This is that belfry that we saw before in a black and white photo. One of the street scenes in uh, Bruges. Uh, another street scene in Bruges. This is a cart that was pulled by dogs. These three dogs have harnesses on them and they were used to pull the cart. Uh, a religious parade in, in the street. Uh, seen in Brussels, another uh, market square. He took a lot of photographs of market squares. Here's Dinant again colorized. Uh, street scene in Ghent. And a couple of them I experimented with making them look like using feature filters in Photoshop to make them look like paintings. This is one of those that was made to look like a painting in addition to being colorized. This one also. I discovered just a few minutes before the show started that I spelled Harlem wrong in this. I have to go back and fix it. This is, this is a, I think this one came out particularly well. This is a, I think this is a really nice photograph. This one too, in Delft. Another uh, scene in Dama in Belgium. Uh, but another another one of those canal scenes uh, with the uh, poplar trees. And here we are back in uh, Lake Como again. These uh, the the roofs of a lot of these houses appeared in a number of his paintings. They were actually red. Uh, the the red didn't come out in the uh, I mean, it didn't come out in the colorization process, but you'll see an example in some of the painting in a painting coming up. There's uh, Winsford, village of Winsford, Nuremberg. This is Colebrook, Connecticut. So Eaton rented a cabin in Colebrook, Connecticut. This is the cabin that he 
spent time in um, in the summer in the summers sometimes when he wasn't in Europe. Another scene in Colebrook. I thought this one came out. These several scenes in Colebrook, I thought, came out particularly well with colorization, including this one. Colorization algorithms know that barns are red, I guess. And these are some of the, so these are some of my, some of the things I discovered by looking at close ups. This is Eaton. Um, he's walking under an arbor at, uh, I'm, I don't remember, but it's probably Lake Como. It's one of the lakes in Italy and probably one of the arbors that it inspired the arbor that he built in his backyard. And that's Eaton on the right in a boat in Colebrook, Connecticut. And you'll see little things like, you know, people just doing everyday things like a woman carrying buckets. This is a sign that appeared on a number of buildings and looking at it up closely and doing a little bit of research. This is a Singer sewing machine sign um, that was that was painted on on walls of, of buildings and on streets in 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 Bruges and uh, it appears in several of the Bruges photographs. And here's a close up of the dogs pulling the cart. And the girls that we saw earlier in Noki Heist. A man and a woman sawing a tree. And these are guys on the street and we saw before in Ghent. There's the man at the urinal colorized. The woman doing laundry and you know. Seen in Brussels. And this is just a, a very elaborate street bite that um, was in one of the towns in uh, Mechelen. This is a close up of um, Market Square in Frankfurt. Another Market Square, this one in Nuremberg. And these are um, uh, advertisement poster advertisement posters that were pasted up on walls. And this was an advertisement that was similar uh, uh, posted onto a, a wall in Venice. Some kids in Dama. And this was a negative that was that had a, some damage and was difficult to make out some of the the people in the scene and, and this is an example of how colorizing it actually brought out some of the details that made it um, a, a better photograph lake lugano was another lake that he photographed the women doing laundry again <clears throat> this is a street light I don't really know. I couldn't find anything out about this. It looks like behind the street light, there's a sort of a display case that's built into the corner of the house. The background around it is painted a different color. And it looks like there's a figure inside the display case. I'm, I'm guessing that it, it might be a saint or something that represented the name of the street or the location. But there are several of these in photographs. And the, the, the lamp, the gas, the street lights were gas. Um, and in the cabin that I showed earlier in Colebrook, Connecticut, Eaton had one of his pine tree paintings nailed to the front of the cabin. This is it. You can't see a lot of detail because we're zooming in. But um, that's that's a painting that's of his pine tree that's on the front of the cabin. So in this section, I'm I, I found this is where I actually found photographs that matched paintings. So some of the paintings were um, 
the things that I just found online, um, some of them were for sale, some of them were just on sites where they had collections of paintings. Um, but this is an example of the red roofs that you'd, you'd see in uh, Lake Como. Another example with the red roofs. They were, they were uh, mostly terracotta, as far as I can tell. the belfry at night. He also did a number of paintings that were night scenes. <clears throat> this is a chapel in uh, Bruges called the Jerusalem Chapel that's still there and still preserved um, as, as a, a heritage uh, historical site. We also have a version of this of a painting of this of this chapel that is in the evening. We have that in the Historical Society collection. And here's another version of the um, that uh, top of the uh, gate that we saw earlier in Bruges. And the poplars on the canal. So in this slide, the far left is the painting, the center is the black and white photograph, and the right is the colorized photograph. I didn't find any of the pine tree photograph, photographs of the pine trees. So that's it. That's the tour, a uh, quick tour of Charles Warren Eaton's photographs. Um, feel free to come here if you're interested in any of these cities in Europe. There's some great photographs. Um, so I hope that you'll come back and explore the site. And if anybody has any questions now, I'll be glad to answer your questions. Thank you, Rich. Those are beautiful images. I have actually a question. The, the photographs that looked like paintings, that was that just an artistic choice of Eaton? Do you know why? I was just curious if you know anything about it. Oh, you mean the ones that I, well, the, the ones I colorized? I colorized some photographs. And because I wasn't completely happy with the way the colorization came out, I, I, blur, I used some of the features in Photoshop to uh, make a little bit more like photographs, but I do believe that in some of the photographs that we have in Bloomfield, I believe that Eaton was actually experimenting. I'll actually show you one of these. I think Eaton was experimenting with making his photographs look more like paintings. I, I think he was applying some kind of um, coating to the negative, and this is one of them. This is this is a photograph that we have the negative, but but it looks like a, a charcoal drawing or or a painting. Right. Interesting. This is Third River um, in Bloomfield. Uh, this is <laughs> that where those. This is a willow grove under the under the bridge. This is the um, this is the Baldwin Street Bridge here, <laughs> and the trees are a willow grove that was along Third River, and um, uh, these willow trees are now in the back of where McDonald's is on Broad Street. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> um, Jean, I see you raised your hand. If you wanted to go ahead and unmute, feel free to do that. This is the other direction on Broad Street. That's Broad Street. That's houses are on Broad Street looking for Third River. Rich, thank you very much. That was a wonderful array of photos, and I'm I'm intrigued by the colorization algorithms. I can see why once it recognizes a barn, it puts in red. But what happens when it's people's clothing? What happens when it's trees? Well, I guess you'd have to 
you'd have to put in something indicating it's autumn. So we have to have some red ones in there. Yeah, um, you, that's why I showed you the best of them. There were some that didn't come out very well. And some of these, it didn't really know what to do. Um, an example um, is the some of those, um, where's the one up the, the um, oh, I think I had that in the, uh, yeah, I, they, uh, at least um, I, uh, as, as I was using these colorization programs, they're probably, they probably have more sophisticated features than what I was using. I would like to have said, these roofs should be red, make them red. And you, you may be able to do that, but I, I didn't get that involved in it. But this is an example where it, it sort of didn't know what to do. It didn't know what this thing was. This is a fountain that probably just would have been um, masonry or might have been some kind of metal. But it, it just sort of made it look sort of rainbowy. It didn't it didn't really know what to do with it. I think it does okay with people's faces. It knew the baskets were supposed to be brown, but it didn't really know what to do with some of this stuff. Thank so, you. I, yeah, I picked the ones that I thought were the best. They were great. Thanks. We have a question in the chat from Alex. Is curious. Do you know what happened to the hundreds of paintings his niece inherited? Well, she uh, sold most of them. A lot of them, the fam family members have. Um, but because he had debts, uh, one of the things that she did was sell some of the paintings to make up for the debts. And the story, uh, there, was, um, there were some paintings that remained that also had some of his artifacts that were, that were purchased by a gallery the Spannerman Gallery. They did an Eaton exhibit and they also did a catalog. But Spannerman was um, was very interested in um, contemporary, well, th this period of American painters. And um, uh, he bought he bought a whole batch from uh, of paintings after Priscilla sort of Everybody in the family got some of the, photo, the paintings that they wanted and uh, some of the ones that were left, she sold a lot of them, a lot of what was remaining to Spannerman. And in the video that she has in her house, she still had a lot of them then. I'm not sure exactly when the period was that she sold them. But one of the things that she, in the collection that she sold to Spannerman were a whole collection of artifacts, including the catalogs of most of the exhibits that he did between 1900 and 1910 or 15. And we just acquired those at the museum. Um, it also includes, um, well, a, a little more detail about some of the awards that he got and some of the exhibits that he showed at. And it also includes a journal of each one of the paintings that he sold and how much he got for it. Hmm. Uh, a guy named Charles Tease Clark wrote uh, wrote a book, one of one of the catalogs about Eaton, and uh, I communicate with him a lot. He helped out with some of the some of the identifying some of the photographs and some of the information about Eaton. But he ended up after Spannerman bought this stuff. Somebody in Lambertville bought them from Spannerman, and then somebody bought them from him, and then Charles bought them from him, and Charles donated them the the artifacts to um, the historical site. David Lennon, I'm glad to see you're here. I don't know what you, I didn't know what you'd want to tell people about your connection to Eaton, but feel free to tell people if you have a, want to tell a little bit about your. I, I, I purchased, this was about 10 years ago. I think one of the Lambertville paintings I bought at David Rago's auction. I think, he, I think, the, mono, I think the mono prints might have been part of that batch. No, the mono prints I bought at Swan in New York City. Uh, the one I bought at Rago's was the uh, Schmiedenport gate that you showed at the beginning, uh -huh. the, the Bruges, and it was so dark when I bought it, you couldn't really tell what it was. I almost bought it more for the frame, uh, and I paid a reasonable price for a frame. And I then said, well, I have it cleaned up, and when it got cleaned up, there's so much more that you could see. It's still a very dark image. It, the picture you showed is much enhanced in terms of 
uh, making it more visible, but it's a charming painting. And the blue of the sky is like a Maxfield Parrish nighttime, early evening blue. And I got hooked on Eaton and I bought some mono prints at Swan. I picked up two or three other little things that he's done. Nothing as good as the mono prints or, or the Schmiedenport. But I was recently in um, Nashville, Tennessee at a museum there called Cheekwood. Hmm. And they had one um, Eaton uh, nestled in a foursome of three other uh, George Ennises hmm. prominently displayed on one of the walls. So I, I, I'll send you pictures of that. Okay. Right. Um, it's always nice to see him come up. Definitely influence there um, from Ennis to Eaton. Yeah. And uh, I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation tonight. It was it was great seeing them right in front of me on the screen. I will definitely go to the website and I will definitely pester you some more. Feel free. I like, uh, I'm very in interested in this stuff. I'm a little bit obsessed with it. To, to do a thousand, a thousand negatives, it took, uh, this actually started, the thousand negatives started as a pandemic project. I figured, you know, Gee, I'm stuck at home and I don't have anything to do. Why don't I scan these negatives? And so that's, that started as a pandemic project. And then I, once I got started, I got hooked and had to do finish. You, do you know if any of his photographs were published? There, there were a plethora of photography magazines at the time, and a lot of the better pictures did get published. Do you know if anything of his? I don't. I never heard of anything uh, uh, about that. The um, the only the only ones that I saw that were published were published were the ones that Maureen O'Brien, who I quoted from, in the catalog. She was describing the the type of photography that he did and the way he composed them, and she included several of the photographs. As a matter of fact, that's how I knew we had them in the historical society. I knew that we had. I, I originally found the Morris Canal photographs. They had all had been neatly compiled into a binder. And then I saw this, uh, the catalog that Maureen had these photographs, just little small thumbnails of the photographs that she was describing. And she attributed them to the Historical Society of Bloomfield. <laughs> well, gee, we, you, you mean we've got these somewhere? So I've been looking through our archives years. It took, I, I just happened to stumble upon them. Uh, I found these boxes. They were actually in, uh, some like tin candy boxes. Uh, one of them had some severe water damage and um, they, they, they weren't carefully preserved. So as I went through the collection, I, I cataloged all of them and they're in uh, protective sleeves now. So they're all protect, the original negatives are all well protected. You mentioned that there's one in the Montclair Art Museum collection. I think it's interesting to note that that was one of the the first paintings that the museum acquired. I think they acquired about 50 paintings from one collector and, and that was in that group. Mm. So he's been around at the museum for a good long while. I think it's actually the accession number might be number two. Wow. <laughs> mm. uh, tell people how to see the historical society. Uh, you have limited hours as I recall. Yeah, so well, um, and I, I don't, didn't, uh, the, the other, so the, the Eaton photographs of Bloomfield are on the charleswardine.org site. But the other photographs, we do have a collection of other photographs that I also, I, I do a lot of this digitization of negatives and lantern slides. We do have, uh, Historical Society has a whole separate collection of other people, um, Nathan Russell and Reverend Frainer. Those are on the hsob.org website. But if you go to hsob.org, you will you can find information about the hours of the museum. You're usually open on Saturdays from like 1030 to noon, around that time. But it's best to call first uh, to make sure somebody's there. Sometimes the person doesn't make it because of the weather or, but um, yeah, so we're open on, usually open on Saturdays. We have a museum that's on the, uh, the top floor of the, of the children's library at 90 Broad Street. Rich, I love the web. What you've done with the website, it's it's really so nicely organized, um, and and the the cloud tag also is really interesting and um, a fun way to 
you know, find things that you're interested in. So beautiful job there. I also wanted to mention that um, this week when we were um, writing for Women's History Month, um, I wrote, a, we, we highlighted three creative women. Um, I was writing about Emily Greeno and, um, and, you know, of course she was married to Walter Greeno. They were both in the Montclair Artist Colony and um, her husband was in the Montclair um, Camera Club. Oh. So I'm sure that they knew each other and um, he died in 1898. Um, he died very young, but he was definitely an early um, adapter of photography. And I'm sure that they knew each other. Yeah. But, and, and, and so was Florence Rand Lang in the camera club. Mm. Yeah. That, this artist colony in, in Montclair, too. I mean, that's one of the reasons that I should have mentioned, too. That's one of the reasons that Eaton moved to this area because of the the artist colony in, in Montclair, um, he was uh, right at home there. And, and the camera club was connected. People were connected there also. One oh. other um, question, Rich, in the chat was just, where was his studio and home in Bloomfield located? 63 Monroe Place. The house is still there. It was, uh, Monroe Place is, was actually uh, nicknamed Victorian Row. It was uh, that most of the houses on that street were built in the late 1800s, 1870s. Very, very distinctly Victorian style, although a lot of them have been covered with aluminum siding. But um, his house was not, his house being built in 19, what did I say, 1913 or 14, I think, uh, didn't, didn't match the Victorian style, but was uh, more of a contemporary look. I, I had a, I was for the historical society. I was using a free photo gallery software called Zen Photo, and I just had a lot of problems with it. It was getting it got hacked frequently, and I had to redo things frequently. So I'm using something called J Album, which um, has it skins. I mean, it's intended for photography exhibition to for exhibiting photographs for photographers. A lot of photographers use it, and it turned out to be very um, very useful for this purpose it, with the tag cloud and the slideshow features. And it's really easy to use and very, um, very robust. And, I, and, and um, I had to spend a lot of time doing updates on that other stuff. And it's easy to do updates. And you, for $35, you can get the, the product and hosting for a year. So this is hosted we're paying thirty-five dollars to for a year to host these thousands of photographs and uh, on this software called J Album. That's great to know. That was actually going to be a follow-up email question for me in the museum field. What were you using <laughs> so to do that? That's great. Thank you. Just, I, I sort of like this black background and the, the because they're black and white photographs. But there's a lot of flexibility with other skins you can use with. A lot of different looks and features and colors and stuff. Very nice. Any other questions or anyone who wants to unmute before we wrap I up? I have a quick question. Yeah. So great, great lecture. It was wonderful and so visual, which is lovely to see, right? Um, I'm curious about the land, and, and you might not know this, but the lantern format. Is it, was it the only game in town? Was it only used by artists or was it kind of more, you know, for the everyday shooter and was it expensive to process? Do you know any of that? A little bit, I know a little bit. So um, the photographs that I showed of London were, were souvenir photographs that you would have bought. So if, you know, I don't know if you've, when I was a kid, when we got go sightseeing places, they'd sell these little 35 millimeters or uh, Kodachrome slides of, of a site, a historic site, and you could buy those. And it was a similar concept. So you could buy a batch of lantern slides of London, which, which somebody did, which um, the, the ones that I got, Fred Branch, the late Fred Branch, who was also a trustee and newsletter editor at the Historical Society for many years, was very interested in um, Crystal Palace and the um, Centennial ex exhibitions and those kind of things. He collected things ab about those. So he bought these at a at a um, 
at a used bookstore or uh, um, a, an antique shop. So they kind of came in a box and they were probably pretty much, I think they probably were purchased piecemeal but collected into a box. So you, you could buy these. And, and some of the ones that Reverend Frainer has, um, he, he got a bunch of them of Switzerland that um, were probably purchased also. And they were, they were colorized. Some of them were colorized too. They hand colored them. We also have a collection of slide magic lantern slides that belong to the Presbyterian Church in Bloomfield. And what they did was they used them in a, in a similar way that, that we would do a slideshow today. There were photographs that were, they might have had a photograph or they may have even had a photograph in a book that they would have photographed and made in, had made into a lantern slide. Some of them were colorized and then they would put on shows that would, you know, um, like the um, historical sites in Bloomfield. So we've, we've got a whole um, set of these lantern slides from the Presbyterian Church that are that were given as a program in uh, probably 1912 or some, 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 sometime around that time, where they would put on a program at the church and invite everybody over and show these the slideshow of historic sites. And then photographs, I, I have found the, that the quality of the lantern slides is not as good as a negative. Um, when they go through whatever the process is to make, well, it's uh, the, the commercial ones, the ones that you bought were, were high, higher quality. But um, the ones that I found that were made, uh, so now I'm assuming that, that Reverend Frainer would have had negatives and he would have had the negatives made into lantern slides. So they weren't as high quality as the lantern slides, but he had them made into lantern slides. I, and I don't think that an average typical person would have had the equipment, although some people probably did. But you're more likely to, I mean, he was affiliated with the church and they were used for church Sunday school and he would do Friday evening programs where he'd show slides of the trip to a missionary, missionary trips to Palestine. Also in, in the collection, which I haven't scanned, is, is this whole collection of um, biblical figures. You know, there's a there's a photograph of Moses and, and Mary and they're, you know, wearing this, these outfits that are, that are, they're supposed to represent these biblical characters that are photographs that they made lantern slides of that they would have used in, in a uh, church program. But his process was strictly lantern, right? Um, I'm not sure, but I, um, what we have of, of his are the lantern slides. I'm assuming that he probably also had negatives that were, were not saved. Um, so, some of his, I know, were purchased, and some of them, I'm assuming, were made into lantern slides from photographs that he had. But the lantern slide lantern slides got saved because they were actually in boxes. He his, his slides were very most of them were very carefully cataloged and captioned or labeled, at least labeled what the location was. Um, in in boxes and and carefully stored, um, so his grandson had that collection and he gave it to us. He also gave us the lantern projector, which is a huge thing. I mean, it's like a couple feet high by a, maybe a foot wide. It had a 500 watt light bulb, and um, to to actually use the you had to manually put the slides in one at a time. Or actually, they had it could hold two slides at a time, and you'd shift one and change the slide and shift back. But to um, to to manipulate those things would would really degrade them seriously. That's one of the reasons I wanted to digitize them to protect to protect and preserve. All right. Thank you so much again. Glad you enjoyed it.